Hello, my name is Jeremy, and this is the True Crime Chronicles channel. The 20-year-old model Dorothy Stratton possessed everything. Youth, allure, wealth, triumph, and a cherished partner. She was nicknamed the Canadian Cinderella. Dorothy was foreseen to have a bright future in the limelight, but destiny had different intentions. Dorothy Ruth Hoog Stratton was her complete name. She entered the world on February 28, 1960, in a humble neighborhood of Vancouver, on the city's fringe. Her parents relocated to Canada from the Netherlands a year following Dorothy's birth. The Hoog Stratton family then embraced a son, John, and after seven years, a younger sister, Louise. The Hoog Strattons led a very simple life. Dorothy excelled academically in school. She never aspired to become a celebrity, nor contemplated a glamorous career. During her childhood, all Dorothy yearned for were basic things that her impoverished family couldn't provide. In 1977, as a high school student, Dorothy worked as a waitress at a local fast food joint, Dairy Queen. Sporting blonde hair, a charming face, and an advanced figure for her age, the 17-year-old quickly garnered attention from patrons. Not just young males, but also older, prosperous men were captivated by her beauty. One evening, Roughly 30 minutes before the closure of the snack bar where Dorothy was employed, a captivating young man named Paul Snyder walked in. He quickly spotted the young, appealing waitress. Paul made his order, and upon payment, he presented her with a high denomination bill. Dorothy mentioned she couldn't provide change for such a large amount. Paul grinned and suggested she keep the change, on the condition she'd go on a date with him. Without any delay, the girl consented. At that time, 26-year-old Paul Snyder was quite a familiar figure in Vancouver. His job involved managing and scouting so-called night butterflies for club gigs. He had numerous friends and connections throughout Canada. When Paul first laid eyes on 17-year-old Dorothy, a tall blonde with a radiant white smile and a graceful physique, he instantly recognized her immense potential. Paul took the stunner out on a date to a fancy restaurant, and afterwards, he gifted her a red evening gown, which she later donned for her high school prom. Paul and Dorothy initiated their relationship. Her parents remained unconcerned about their romance and didn't restrict their daughter from seeing a man nine years her elder. A few months into their relationship, Paul started coaxing the blonde to engage in a daring photo shoot. At first, Dorothy was reluctant, but Paul persisted, asserting that she had excellent prospects in modeling and could earn a substantial income. Finally, she agreed to his suggestion. Paul secured a studio, employed a professional photographer, and arranged for the waitress to participate in a nude-themed photo shoot. Once the photos were completed, he forwarded them to the editorial team of the globally renowned men's magazine, Playboy. Dorothy's pictures created a stir. A Playboy editor invited her to Los Angeles, aware that her parents would disapprove of her working for such a provocative magazine. Paul fabricated Dorothy's mother's signature, claiming she permitted her daughter to ink a deal with the famed magazine. In the summer of 1979, Paul and Dorothy journeyed together from Canada to the United States, landing in Hollywood. By August, Dorothy Stratton had risen to fame as Playboy magazine's Playmate of the Month, and subsequently, she started working as a bunny at the Playboy Club. She admitted to her friends over the phone that her new role was quite overwhelming. Unaccustomed to such limelight, she found it daunting as affluent men were smitten with the model, eager to spend time with her and lavishing her with praises. Paul Snyder was constantly by her side, offering his support. He took on the roles of her manager and chauffeur, organizing photo shoots and negotiating contracts. Dorothy's existence was entirely dominated by this man. To strengthen their bond, Paul proposed marriage. The model was initially unsure about marrying but ultimately consented, feeling indebted to him. Dorothy realized that without Paul Snyder, she would likely still be a waitress at a snack bar, reliant on tips. Her life would not have taken its fairy tale turn. Dorothy's family cautioned her against marrying Paul, suspecting that he was exploiting the young woman for financial gain. In 1979, the same year, Paul and Dorothy tied the knot in Las Vegas. The wedding was simple, without any lavish festivities. The duo remained industrious post-marriage. Dorothy was involved in filming several movies, where directors acknowledged her not just for her beauty and allure but also for her acting prowess. As Dorothy's fame and earnings escalated, she used her income to purchase a spacious home in Los Angeles, where she resided with her husband. Paul Snyder was content with his wife's achievements. 
he boasted to his friends that Dorothy's rising popularity was a collective success. Acting as her manager, he was a constant presence at her shoots and events, overseeing their finances and assets. He also kept a close watch on her diet, clothing choices, alcohol intake at social gatherings, and occasionally guided her on whom to engage with intimately among influential figures to further her career. Speculations arose about Dorothy having a romantic liaison with Hugh Hefner, the chief editor of Playboy magazine. However, Hefner refuted these claims, asserting that Stratton was not a woman of loose morals. As time progressed, the model began to discern that her husband, Paul, was exerting excessive control over her life. She appointed a new professional manager and started excluding her husband from photo shoots, fabricating various pretexts. The gap between the couple widened, and sensing this, Paul's mental state deteriorated. He guarded his wife with insane jealousy, even employing a private detective to monitor her movements. Yet, no incriminating evidence surfaced. Paul began to impose restrictions on his wife's wardrobe, disallowing her from wearing provocative attire, not wanting men who offered no financial gain to their family to admire her. He instigated conflicts, and in moments of rage, even resorted to physical abuse. Dorothy found herself unable to endure her husband's aggressive outbursts and increasingly sought distance from him. Their friends and colleagues observed the mounting troubles in Paul and Dorothy's marriage. Staff at Playboy frequently advised the model to terminate her relationship with her husband. While Dorothy was occupied with photo shoots, Paul resided in their house, utilizing his wife's earnings and languishing in inactivity. One day, he discovered that Dorothy had established a company under her name and was actively investing in it. This move, advised by her manager, was strategically arranged so that in the event of a divorce, Paul Snyder would not have any claim over the money. Paul's behavior escalated into creating more scandals, as he found his influence over his wife waning, with her seldom returning home. Snyder began to grasp that his control over what he deemed his golden ticket was slipping through his fingers. In the spring of 1980, at a gathering in the Playboy Mansion, 20-year-old Dorothy encountered the renowned 40-year-old film director, Peter Bogdanovich, a close associate of Hugh Hefner. The director was captivated by the model and extended an invitation for her to act in his upcoming comedy, They All Laughed. Dorothy accepted the offer to portray the role of a mistress. On March 22nd, Stratton embarked on a solo trip to New York for the filming of the comedy. She misled her husband, claiming that the director had prohibited anyone besides the cast and crew from being on set. She convinced Paul to remain in Los Angeles. In truth, she feared that Paul might create disturbances during the shoot. Furthermore, the blonde requested her manager to filter calls from her overbearing husband. During her time on set in New York, Dorothy found herself deeply enamored with Bogdanovich. A fervent romance blossomed between the actress and the director. Dorothy exuded joy in the company of this new figure in her life, not wanting to forego the opportunity with the sophisticated, affluent, and influential director. Her demeanor towards her husband grew distant and aloof. Dorothy spent two months in New York, and throughout this period, Paul Snyder was left alone in their large house in Los Angeles. He sometimes brought other women home, who were astonished to discover that Paul was being unfaithful to such a stunning spouse, a Playboy model. In April 1980, Dorothy returned to California for the Playboy Awards ceremony. She earned the prestigious title of Playmate of the Year and graced the magazine's cover, gaining a new accolade. As part of her recognition, she received a lavish gift from Playboy, a Jaguar sports car, and a cash award of $200,000. She had developed a close friendship with Hugh Hefner, the chief editor, who harbored great expectations for the rising star. Following the ceremony, Dorothy embarked on a two-week promotional tour across Canada. On weekends, she flew out for dates with director Peter Bogdanovich. She intended to spend the final days of the tour with her family in Vancouver. Upon learning this, Paul Snyder immediately flew to Canada, leveraging his past experience as a nightclub manager and his numerous connections in Vancouver. During Dorothy's brief holiday, Paul coerced her into working in clubs and pocketed all the profits. During this time, a significant altercation erupted between the couple, where Dorothy, in tears, suggested quitting her career to salvage their marriage. She proposed that they both return to her parents and start afresh. Snyder, however, rejected this idea. After the tour in Canada, Dorothy returned to New York and continued filming the comedy, They All Laughed. She ignored her husband's calls and further distanced herself from him. One day, 
Dorothy called Paul herself and asked for more freedom in their relationship. Snyder was in depression and very angry with his wife. It is known that at that time, Paul Snyder was involved with a young girl who was not yet 18 years old. She had a model-like appearance, and Paul wanted to make her a new Playboy bunny. However, he soon realized that his young lover would never be able to overshadow his wife. In June 1980, on their first wedding anniversary, Paul received a distressing letter from Dorothy. She expressed her desire for a divorce in the letter and declared that she would cease to provide him with financial support. This confirmed Paul's fears. He was now convinced that Dorothy was being unfaithful with the director Peter Bogdanovich. In response, Snyder employed a private investigator to collect evidence of his wife's alleged affair. On one occasion, Paul called Dorothy's manager, threatening to create a disturbance or possibly do something even more drastic. The manager cautioned Dorothy to hire a bodyguard and be cautious of her envious husband, but the model disregarded this advice. As a non-resident alien in America without a green card, Paul faced employment barriers. His financial resources were dwindling, leading him to deplete their joint bank accounts. He liquidated Dorothy's valuable items, including collectibles, jewelry, and the Jaguar sports car she had been gifted by Playboy. He offloaded these assets at steep discounts, strictly accepting cash transactions. Moreover, Paul started renting out rooms in their expansive home to friends, partly driven by his depression and loneliness. Gradually, he began to contemplate returning to his homeland, Canada. In mid-July, the shooting for They All Laughed wrapped up. Subsequently, Dorothy and Bogdanovich embarked on a 10-day getaway to England. They returned to Los Angeles together on July 30th, with Dorothy moving into the director's mansion located in the upscale Bel Air neighborhood. On the afternoon of July 31st, Paul Snyder borrowed a handgun from an acquaintance. Late that evening, he approached Peter Bogdanovich's residence, armed. Paul concealed himself nearby, resolute in his decision to shoot anyone who approached the mansion's gates. After several hours of waiting and growing impatient, Paul drove to a mountainous area that overlooked nocturnal Los Angeles. He later confided to a friend that during his solitary time in the mountains, he was tormented by harrowing thoughts of taking his own life. Late into the night, Snyder made his way back to their home. A week later, on August 8th, Paul managed to convince Dorothy to meet him at their residence. He harbored hopes of rekindling their relationship, reminiscent of the charm he wielded in the modest diner where they first encountered each other. However, Dorothy who arrived was no longer the naive schoolgirl he once knew. She had transformed into a self-assured woman, no longer swayed by her husband's persuasions. Dorothy revealed to Paul her love for another man and her intention to divorce. Snyder, maintaining his composure, requested that she return in a week to calmly discuss the particulars of their separation. The following day, Paul zealously set out to purchase a firearm. He scoured shops, but his Canadian citizenship deterred sellers from transacting with him. He even asked his private investigator to procure a rifle under the pretext of self-protection and home security. But the detective dissuaded him and declined to assist. On August 11th, Snyder spotted an ad in the newspaper. A hunter was selling his old 12-gauge shotgun. He drove to the San Fernando Valley, intending to inspect and potentially acquire the firearm. Unfortunately, he lost his way, failed to locate the address, and had to return without the shotgun. On August 13th, Two days later, Paul revisited the same location. This time, he successfully found the seller and purchased the aged shotgun, telling the seller of his plans to go hunting. On August 14th, in anticipation of his meeting with Dorothy, Paul Snyder requested his roommates to vacate the house until evening to ensure uninterrupted privacy for his conversation with his wife. Dorothy's managers and assistants had urged her to let them accompany her to the meeting or to handle the divorce discussions over the phone. However, Dorothy chose to go alone. She carried a substantial amount of money with her, intending to express her gratitude to Paul generously for his past contributions to her life. She aimed for a peaceful separation and hoped to maintain a cordial relationship. Believing the meeting would be brief, she scheduled a photo shoot for later that evening. Dorothy arrived at her home at noon on August 14th to meet with Paul Snyder. He courteously welcomed her inside. Shortly after, her phone rang. It was a safety check call from her manager. They had prearranged that if Dorothy encountered any trouble, she would use a specific code word during the call. She assured the caller that all was well and quickly concluded the conversation. 
The discussion between Dorothy and Paul continued, but it eventually escalated into a dispute. In a sudden, violent outburst, Paul Snyder produced the shotgun and fatally shot Dorothy in the face. It was reported that following this heinous act, Paul engaged in a necrophilic act with his deceased wife before turning the gun on himself. At 8 p.m., the roommates returned to the house, noticing Stratton's car parked outside. Inside, they found the model's handbag in the living room. Assuming that Paul had made up with his wife and they were together in the bedroom, the roommates retreated to their own room, turned on the TV, and endeavored to be as quiet as possible, not wanting to intrude on the couple's privacy. In the meantime, Dorothy's managers became increasingly anxious as she had ceased responding to their calls. At 11 p.m., they finally managed to contact someone at Paul and Dorothy's residence. The roommates took the call, and after hanging up, they decided to check the master bedroom. There, they stumbled upon a gruesome sight. Both Dorothy and Paul were found dead. Forensic specialists concluded that the 20-year-old Dorothy Stratton had died approximately one hour after her arrival at the house. Her 29-year-old husband, Paul Snyder, died about an hour following his wife's death. Hugh Hefner was among the first to be informed of the tragic event. He took it upon himself to contact his friend, Peter Bogdanovich, to relay the devastating news. Upon hearing about Dorothy's death, Bogdanovich was so overwhelmed that he fainted. Following this, he spent an extended period under the influence of sedatives to cope with the shock and grief. The August edition of Playboy magazine had already been dispatched for printing, making it impossible for the editors to change the cover in time. As a result, it featured Dorothy Stratton, who had tragically passed away. However, for the annual Playboy calendar, her image was substituted with that of another model. Hugh Hefner offered his perspective on the tragic incident, stating, There is a stereotype that a poor girl from a small town makes it to the pages of a magazine, moves to Hollywood, builds a dazzling career, and then dies tragically at the height of her powers. But it's not always the case. Paul Snyder was a sick jerk who realized that his lucky ticket was slipping away, and that's what drove him to commit this awful act. Peter Bogdanovich took charge of organizing and funding Dorothy Stratton's funeral. The loss of his beloved profoundly impacted him. He decided on cremation for her remains, which were then interred in a cemetery in Los Angeles. Following the tragic demise of the model, the film studio chose not to release They All Laughed. Bogdanovich, determined to showcase the work, purchased the film rights using his own finances. The comedy They All Laughed was eventually released in 1981. Despite the efforts, the film did not garner any significant accolades and failed to captivate the audience's interest. This commercial failure led Bogdanovich to lose millions and ultimately resulted in him declaring bankruptcy. Several years after Dorothy Stratton's passing, rumors surfaced about director Peter Bogdanovich secretly meeting her younger sister, Louise Stratton, who was 13 at the time. The Stratton family strongly refuted these claims and legally contested the spread of these rumors. However, in 1988, eight years later, the 49-year-old Bogdanovich married 20-year-old Louise Stratton. Louise later stated in interviews that their romance began when she was 18. The union of Peter Bogdanovich and Louise Stratton lasted for 13 years, ending in divorce in 2001. Peter never remarried, dedicating his life to his cinematic endeavors. He passed away in 2022 at the age of 82. Louise Stratton, now residing in her hometown of Vancouver, pursues a career as a Canadian actress and producer. Over four decades since Dorothy Stratton's murder, her life and story continue to inspire various creative works, including films, books, and songs. A recent tribute to her is seen in the crime drama series, Welcome to Chippendales, which chronicles the story of the famed male strip dance group Chippendales, co-founded by Paul Snyder. In this series, Dorothy Stratton is portrayed by Nicola Peltz, who is married into the Beckham family. If you like this story, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new videos. Don't forget to like and share your opinion in the comments. This is Jeremy. See you in the next video.